All right, we're going to take you on a journey that will explain structural equation modeling. It is kind of related to path analysis. It uses multiple regression information, correlations, that kind of stuff. But it's basically trying to confirm that the data collected from these measured variables, those were the rectangles, does in fact fit this theoretical model. So I'm going to say that again. Does the data support this theory? Okay, SEM. That's what we're going to use now instead of structural equation modeling. It's kind of hard to say. So in a nutshell, what you're going to do first is you're going to build a measurement model using the given data. Those are the rectangles, the measured variables. Each one of those is like a survey. So let's look at the original model again. So like this one, staying intentions. That, that's like four different surveys here that measure staying intentions. Job satisfaction, right? There's five different surveys here that try to measure job satisfaction, that kind of thing. So we're going to take the data from those surveys to see how, the, how well the models line up with the constructs. And then we're going to, once we built the measurement model, we're going to go ahead and switch it over to the structural model and add the arrows in according to the theory to see if those two line up, if they're a good match. If they do, that means the data does, in fact, support the theory. If they don't, it means just the opposite. And in order to keep this video as short as possible, I might be going a little bit fast on some of these things that we covered in some of the previous sections. Okay, so here's our model. We're going to get to town here. First thing we're going to do is check the assumptions. And the assumptions of a SEM are multivariate normality, univariate normality. We're not going to overly worry about that because most of the data, all of the data, is in Likert scale from 1 to 5. So we that's they're rarely normal. But we will check multivariate normality, multicollinearity, sample size, and positive definiteness. All right, as you recall, positive definiteness has to do with the determinant of the correlation matrix. It cannot equal zero. Okay, so and since this is such a um, crazy thing to try to do by hand, we're going to just wait until we run the EFA later in this test. It will give us the determinant of the correlation, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So let's get started with multivariate normality. So let's pull up the data sheet. Hold on. So multivariate normality, we're going to do the same check that we use for multiple regression models. We're going to go to Analyze. We're going to go to Regression. We're going to make a, a fake regression here to look at the Mahalanobis distance numbers. So our, D, our, our fake DV is going to be the ID number, right? One, two, three, four. That's going to be our fake DV and our IVs are going to be all of our constructs here. I'm sorry, our um, measured variables. Let me just put them in there for you. Hold on. <laughs> Those are going to be our dependent. I'm sorry, our independent IVs. Just to test. Remember, we're just testing to see if there are any outliers. So we really don't care about the estimates or the model fit. We do care about... The Mahalanobis. So you're going to click Save, and there's the Mahalanobis button. That's the only piece of data we want there. Click Continue down here in the bottom. Click OK. And that should give us our maximum Mahalanobis. Remember, that's the only thing we're looking at. Don't care about this. Don't care about that. Da, 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 da. There it is right there in the bottom. Let me pull you up here. All right, according to this, in our data set, we have a Mahalanobis distance of 1 to 1. That's kind of like, that's kind of huge. So I'm going to pick up our calculator real quick. Hold on. So we need to figure out our sample size. What is our sample size? Let me go back and check that. It's 400. That's a pretty good size. Let's get back to this guy. So we have 400. K is the number of variables. So let's go back to this guy and count the variables. Those are the measured variables. So we got 4 plus 4 is 8 plus 4 is 12, 16, looks like 21. And that should give us, okay, so our Mahalanobis distance critical 
is 53. So anything over 53.2 is going to, I'm going to consider an outlier. Hold on. So back to this sheet. Let's scroll over, all the way over to the Mahalanobis. There we are. There you are. And we're going to right click, sort descending. Whoa. So it looks like, what was it, 52? So it looks like we have about 11 outliers. I'm going to go ahead and deselect those. Go to data. Select cases. That's way down on the bottom. Data, select cases. So we're going to do the if condition. If. And we're going to use our Mahalanobis as our splitter. If our Mahalanobis is less than 52.12, and you can click Continue. So we, we set the case that we're going to use, and we're just going to filter out unselected cases. So what the data is going to look like, it should look like this, right? The first 11, these are the ones that will not be used in this study. Okay, so we did have 11 outliers. Now we're going to check for collinearity. Okay, so same thing, regression, linear, same fake DV is our IV, and we want collinearity. Um, we might as well just run it like a regular regression. We should get a column at the very end that measures collinearity. If you remember, it's the VIF and the tolerance column. So let's see what else we can get in here. Let's just do this. I think these are the only ones we need. Um, continue plots. I don't think we need save. I don't think we need options. I don't think we need. So let's just see if we can't get a collinearity column from this data. Here it is right there. So we're looking at the collinearity. So the tolerance has to be less than 0 0.01 or the VIF has to be greater than 10. Given on a quick scan, I do not see anything greater than or less than those values. So we did not violate the assumption of collinearity. All right, so normality, uh, we're not going to worry about univariate normality because, again, it's Likert scale and they're normally not normal. <laughs> and we just did the multivariate normality using the Mahalanobis test. But now let's check out the assumption of linearity. So just remember, linearity is not really needed in this test, but we're going to check it anyway. We're going to go to graphs, legacy, scatter. We're going to go to the matrix. Enter the matrix. We're going to define our variables. Uh, basically, it's just all of the different surveys, the measured variables. Going to stick those in there. Don't need titles. Don't need options. Let's click OK. OK, this is kind of scary looking. It's because there's so many pieces of data in there that it's hard to tell what's going on. But we're going to fix that. We're going to double click. So you're going to add the fit line first. We're just going to pretty this up so you can kind of see what's going on here. And then just click close. Our computer's going really slow because it has a lot of data to process. So just give it some time. So we're going to double click again. We're going to change the chart size. So double click again. Pull this where you can see it. We're going to change the chart size to as soon as it quits this circling thing. Okay, chart size, and we're just going to make this 17. That's a good number. And we're going to apply it. So you got a 21 by 21 square correlation, I'm sorry, scatter plot. So most of them have a linear relationship. We're going to scan this around for you. Hold on. But now remember, uh, 21 squared is 441 of these. So there's a ton of them. But most of them do have some kind of linear relationship. The ones that don't will have a flat horizontal line. There are a couple of those in there. But overall, most of these do look like they do have a, a linear relationship. So that's it for this part. On homoscedasticity. Same thing. Analyze, regression, linear. 
This time we're just going to do the plots. Uh oh, computer's being funny. But we're going to do plots, and we want the Z pred on the bottom and the Z red resid on top. Okay, those are the, those are the residuals or your Y axis, and your predicted values are your X axis. And we should just get a, um, a graph. Hold on, my computer's being funny. So there's the graph of the residuals, and remember, you're going to double-click. You're going to add a lowest line. And hopefully that'll be relatively straight. It won't have any real sharp angles or anything in it. And I think that's what we got here. And according to the lowest line, it, it looks like we did not violate the assumption of homoscedasticity. So let's move on. Last assumption we're going to check is that the variance of any one of these variables, measured variables, cannot be greater than 10 times more than any other of the variance. So we're just going to go to Analyze, Descriptives, probably Descriptives again. So we're going to kick in all our measured variables. And again, we're only looking at the variance. Variance, so we can undo the rest of these. And we just want variance, right? So that should get us a variance chart. There it is right there. Isn't that nice? So they're all pretty much the same except for this. JS5, look at that. JS5, the variance in JS5 is way crazy. So we're probably going to have to delete that. So, But just keep your eye on JS5. Moving on. Did we have an adequate sample size? So there is basically a rule of thumb that states that um, SEM should have a minimum of about 200, but we're going to go ahead and use this calculator that we found online. So we're going to click here. It'll take us to the calculator. And let me move it so you can see it. We want a medium effect size, and that's roughly 0.3. And power is 80%. Latent variables, we got a lot. We got 21. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have five latent variables. Those are the constructs. We have 21 measured variables, which is a lot. And we're going to calculate. And it says that we need a minimum of 92. So we got plenty of people. So sample size taken care of. All right, it's time to start step two, what we call model specification. To make sure that they are, there are indeed five constructs. Okay, that's what the picture says. So let's, right, one, two, three, four, five. So let's go ahead and run our EFA. All right, EFA, which is in one of the other Hawk sections here. We're going to go to Analyze, Dimension Reduction, Factor. And we're going to put in our measured variables. And what do we want to know from them? We want to, basically, I'm just going to click these like I usually do in exploratory factor analysis. So we know how many factors we want. We're going to click Fix Factors. We're going to click 5. And we're going to click Continue. Rotation, we generally go with the Veramax. That's an orthogonal rotation. Scores, eh, we really, I'm going to save them as a new variable. Sometimes you, you really don't need them. Sometimes you do. So I'm just going to do them just to be on the safe side. Options, we're going to suppress. And our cutoff normally is 0 0.3. 0 0.3, get in there, you. And then we're going to hit Continue. And let's see what that pulls out here. All right, here's our factor analysis output sheet. Don't need the correlation matrix. It's too big to look at. You'll notice right up here that the determinant is not equal to zero. It's real close to zero, but it is not equal to zero. Therefore, we prove that we have not violated the assumption of positive definiteness. But our KMO, so our KMO, that means our sample size is sufficient. That's got to be greater than 0.5. And our Bartlett's test of sphericity is significant, which means that at least two of the variables are strongly correlated, which means that you should do a factor analysis. So here's our extractions, all pretty high. And here is our eigenvalues. So I'm looking at the new components. Those are our new constructs. One, two, three, four, five. Number five, 
the eigenvalue is 1.482, but number six, it drops way down. So according to this, there are five new constructs. And there's the unrotated matrix, which we really don't care about. Here's our rotated matrix. I'm looking at the rotated component matrix, and so I'm looking at the OCs. So this one loads under five, that one's under five. So all the OCs look good. I'm gonna give me a second. I'm gonna rearrange these real quick. So it's a much easier to see who's loading up under what. So the EPs are construct one, the SIs are two, the ACs are three, JSs are four, and the OCs are five. And they all load up really well there. Okay, so I think we did a good job on that part. So now we're going to check the individual construct reliability. Hold on one second. So we go to analyze. We go to scale reliability. So for these individual constructs, I'm going to put these in alphabetical order here. So I'm going to do the ACs first. And basically we just want the... Chromebacks Alpha, and if we need to delete anybody. So our AC is fine. Okay, the Chromebacks Alpha is pretty big. Let's go to the next one. We go to Analyze, Scale. Get back in there. Get those out. Let's do the OCs since we're down here. OCs. So the OC reliability is fine. Again, it's greater than 0.7. Let's go to, I don't know, whatever comes next here. So we got the ACs and the OCs. Let's try the, what comes after AC? Let's try the EPs. EP phone home. <laughs> click continue. Click OK. There's the EP reliability. Again, it's really good. Next. And again, what we're doing is we're calculating the reliability for each construct, one at a time. So let's do the JSs. Remember, JS5 was a problem with the variance. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was screwing things up here. Uh-oh. You got a problem with the JSs. Look at that Chromebacks Alpha. It's way too small. So this is the beauty about this box, right? Item total statistics. If you delete any one of these measured variables, it would show you what the change in the Chromebacks would be. And if you look at this very bottom one, JS5, if you deleted it, your Chromebacks Alpha would jump up to 8.804. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and delete JS5, but I'm going to double check that. Kick you out, you're fired, bam, and click OK. Yes. So we just, we just deleted one of the measured variables, JS5, but it did give us a strong reliability for the Chromebacks Alpha. And the last one is, I already forgot. Mm, 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 mm. Nope, not those. It would be the SIs. So let's kick the SIs in. And the JS is out. And then the SI is perfect. It's 0.882. That's really high. So our individual constructs are, in fact, reliable after we got rid of the JS5. So now it's time to identify the exogenous and the endogenous variables. You always start with the exogenous. They're the easiest. Those are the constructs that only have arrows going out. So it looks like AC and EP are exogenous. And the endogenous is any construct that has an arrow going in. So it looks like SI, JS, and OC are the endogenous variables. Now it's time to draw this bad boy in Amos. So give me one second while I pull it up. So here's the model. And we're going to draw the model based on the EFA that we did. So we got rid of JS5 already. So let's go back to here. 
First thing we're going to do is change it from letter format to landscape. Okay, I like mine going sideways, sort of. Okay, so first thing we're going to draw that guy. We're going to duplicate him. Duplicate. And I'm going to put all these on the screen here in a second. So until then, let me get them off the screen. Okay, so there's our constructs. This little one-fingered hand, that's the one that chooses the individuals. Okay, so we're going to click this one. We're going to go to this one. This is going to add our items on top. One, do it again. One, two, three, four. 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 Now I'm going to put them all on the same screen using this time saver. And I'm going to use the spin it tool to kind of clean them up. This one, I want these guys going that way. Isn't that cool? These are going to go down. These are going to go to, I'll put them to the right, I guess. And I'll put these to the right. Let me move this one up a little bit. Okay, I'm going to use this one one more time to get them all on a the screen. There we go. Isn't that pretty? Let me get it all in the same picture for you. There's That's much better. Okay. So now we're going to name the constructs. Click this one. And then we're just going to right click properties and just type in the variable name. That top one was OC. Thank you. This one was JS. This one was AC. This one was SI and this last one was EP and now we're gonna name the items let me click out of this and move this back over here actually that was pretty funny we're having serious difficulty with our computers okay so let's get back to work here time to lame dib Time to name the items. So you get this from this click here. Now this is the data sheet that the SPSS is on. So here's all the OCs. So you just click and drag. OC1, OC2, OC3, OC, can you see? Yuck, yuck, yuck. OC4. See how easy that was? I'm going to pause this while I do the rest. Hold all done. Let's get rid of this. Let me just drag this up so you can see it. So now all of the items are named. So you'll notice that the error terms... Wait, I missed one. Thank you. Please hold. Thank God to have a co-pilot. So it looks like JS1. Where's my JS1 here? Where's my JS1? Well, there it is right on top. My bad. Okay. Boom, 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 boom. Thank you. Now we get rid of this. So you'll notice that the error terms are all blank. That's when we jump to this very cool plugin up here under plugins. Name unobserved variables and it'll turn all those empty circles into error terms and it automatically fills them out. Isn't that cool? All right, here is the initial measurement model. Um, we're not going to put any arrows in here. In fact, I'm going to save this file because I have to come back to it and, and run fit tables on on each construct individually okay but this this is a good way to begin your measurement model all right now it's time for complexity basically that's identifying them the model of, of whether it has the right number of observations and the right number of parameters that kind of thing so we did this back in path analysis but just to res um, refresh your memory the number of observations is the number of rectangles or items times the number of rectangles plus one and whatever that product is divided by two. So it looks like we have 20 items and 20 plus one is 21. So we multiply those together. We get 420. 420, woohoo. Divide that by two. Comes out to be 210. So the number of observations we have is 210. And the number of parameters is a little bit harder, but it has to do with the number of rectangles. And remember to count one error term per rectangle and the number of arrows from the original model and the number of 
exogenous variables. So let's see if we can't get this right. So we have, let's count the arrows, just between the constructs. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven re regression coefficients. Those are the causal arrows. We have 20 items. Those are the rectangles. And then 20 error terms. And how many exogenous variables do we have? Two. Two. And here's something uh, I don't want you guys to forget. But anytime you have a set of exogenous variables, you should also always have a, a double-headed arrow between them. And you're going to add that up as a parameter. So you're going to add that to 1. And if you add all this stuff up, 20 plus 20 plus 7 plus 2 plus 1, I think that's 50. Back to the original formula. Degrees of freedom is the number of observations minus the number of parameters. So it looks like we have a total of 160 degrees of freedom, which means we are definitely over-identified. So we are good to go. We're up to step number three on model identification. Remember, this is still the measurement model. It's time to do some unidimensionality. So we're going to go back to Amos. So here's the measurement model that we made earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save five different copies of this exact same one and delete all but one of the different constructs because with unidimensionality, we have to check the factor loadings between the the construct and the items. So let me go ahead and save five different ones and I'll just pause this video. Please hold. This is the OC construct. So I'm going to go ahead and click and delete everything that's not the OC. Hold on a second. Okay, so we cleaned everything up here. So we're going to do the unidimensionality. We're going to check the factor loadings between the construct and each of the items. So we're going to go ahead and calculate. And then we're going to look at the outputs. And we're just looking at the estimates. So let me pop up here. Estimates. So here they are. So what we're going to do here is we're going to we're going to go ahead and name the largest one with the with the highest estimate. We're going to change this and turn this into a one. So we're going to make OC2 number one. And the rest of them will be mathematically changed going down in order. So it, it's, it'll still be a, um, the relationships will still be the same. But the highest number is going to be a one. So hold on while we do that. So what you do is you go up here on the arrow itself. You right click, object properties. You go to parameters. You get rid of the, the one, just hit delete there, but then very carefully you click on the second arrow. That was the one that will be the unit because it had the largest value. Okay, so we're done with this and then we're going to go ahead and recalculate. Look at the estimates again just to make sure that the estimate output for these things have been fixed, right? So here's our new OC. And sure enough, there's the one. So the largest value for all the factor loadings has been unitized, as I like to say, to one. So you should look at the model fit as well. So you slide it over here. You click the model fit button. And basically, we're looking to see if this model is a good fitting model. What we're going to look at is the fit indices. So we look at the C-min, and it's a good fit because it's not significant. And we're going to look at the other four model fit indices. But we look at the GFI, we want this greater than 0.9. That is really good. NFI, that's really good. CFI, that's really good. So it looks like this is a good construct model. Let's look at the uh, RIM-C. And that's we, we'd like that to have that a little bit lower, but that's kind of borderline. So I'm looking at this OC, and it looks like a good construct. So I'm going to do the other four real quick, but I'm not going to look at the fit indices because... Again, we need to make this as short as possible video. Unidimensionality for EP. Let's do EP phone home. So I'm going to delete everything but EP. I'm just going to pause this video. Nice and clean. No caffeine. There is no mass deleting in Amos. Amos is a, is a bit different to work there. But okay, so we simply have the EP construct. Time to calculate it. Time to look at its estimates. And there they are. Okay, so it looks like 
this one, EP number two to EP is the biggest one. So that's the one we're going to unitize. That's We're going to change number two into a one. So let's pull that up. Okay. Right click carefully. Right click on the arrow. Object properties. You're going to put a one. You're going to click EP4 and get rid of it that. Bam. Wasn't that easy? We're going to recalculate just to make sure that they have been unitized. I think that's a word. So we're going to go back to the estimates. And again, yes, EP2 was now the number one. Okay, so we're going to repeat this with the rest of them. Here's SI. Unit. Okay, we were going to calculate. We're going to look at the estimates. So what do we look like? We got SI4 looks like the winner. So let's go back in here. SI4, right click on the arrow. Now make sure you're on the arrow. So there's number one, object properties. We want that to be a zero. So now we click on this number four, and it should just pop up there. Boom, that's our one. Okay, so good to go. Let's just double check. We're going to recalculate. Look at the estimates. And good, right. So we're good to go on that one. JS time. JS, let's calculate it. Let us click and look at the estimados. Who's the winner here? Winner, 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 chicken dinner. Okay, JS2 is the largest. So JS2, very carefully, right click, wrong one. Okay, so go to the one that has one on it. There we go, just find any one. So JS2, so if it's not JS2, it's going to get a zero. So there's JS2, carefully click on it. Make that a one. Okay, that should do it. Double check. Look at your estimates. And good, right, JS2 has been unitized. Okay, so one more to go. Unidimensionality for AC. Calculate. Open. Look at estimates. Who's the winner? Winner, 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 chicken dinner. Looks like A2. Okay, so we're going to switch A2 over. By, all right, A2. Click on A2, and it's going to be your one. Click on which one has the other one. It looks like A4, AC4. So get rid of AC4. Boom. Okay. And always double check your work. And we're good to go. Okay, so we have unidimensionalized all of them, and they all seem to be doing well. I did not show you the model fit indices. Most of them were all the same, okay? So they were all over 0.9, which were good. So our constructs look good. One of the words I use to describe what we just did is called constrained, okay? So there's the original model where you're going to have estimates between the items and the constructs are going to be greater than one, and then once we constrain them, that turns the largest estimate, the largest factor loading, it's an unstandardized beta weight, or B weight is what it really is, but it turns whatever that number is into one, and that's, that tells you which one of those items is the strongest loaded with the construct. So that's just what we did. So after we change that, again, I call it constrained. That was fun. So we looked at the constructs individually. Now the time has come to perform some confirmatory factor analysis. In other words, we have to prove that the items are in fact loading up under the constructs. It is similar to exploratory factor analysis, but it's kind of backwards, and it's a lot more mathematics involved. So CFA is by far more, a lot more difficult than EFA. So first thing we got to do is we got to look at what makes up confirmatory factor analysis. And there's three different validities. Convergent validity, that means that do the items lo load up very well under the construct? That's convergent validity. Discriminant validity, that is, are the construct constructs measuring different things? Okay, and the last one is nomological validity. That just um, that means is is the overall model 
considered valid. So that the, the nomological is a little bit difficult to explain, but we'll wait till we get there. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with convergent validity. So two parts to convergent validity. The first part is we got to calculate the what we call the average variance extracted test statistic. We're just going to refer to it as the AVA. We want that value to be greater than 0.5. Second part is what we call composite reliability. And that goes by CR. And we want that value to be greater than 0.7. So we found this very cool worksheet online that will do this for us. And here it is. It's also in this Moodle somewhere. Just look around. It's called the AV and CR calculator. All right, first construct, we're going to go ahead and use the JS. Just be very, very careful. You're going to use the standardized regression weights, either from the constrained models or the pre-constrained models. You're going to get the same answer. So here's the JS. What you're going to do is simply cut and paste these numbers into this calculator. Okay, let me delete all these. So you're going to right-click and paste. So, and this amazing calculator gives us the ABE and the CR for each of the constructs. So, these are the JS. I'm going to put these in a chart. Give me a second. They're right there. In fact, I've already pre-done these, but I'm going to do one more and then just pause the video. So, let's do the AC. You're going to go to the AC standardized regression weights. You're going to cut and paste these into our super cool AVE calculator and it gives us the AVE values and the CR values. So I did them all. So you'll notice that the AVEs are all greater than 0.5 and the CRs are all greater than 0.7. So what we have just proved is that our constructs do in fact have convergent validity. So now we're going to move on to discriminant validity everybody's favorite. So what this is trying to decide is if the constructs are measuring different things, and they should be, right? So how we check on the validity for discrimination is we're going to compare the squared correlations and the AV scores for each of the pairwise constructs. So what that means is we have to get a list of correlations between all the five constructs. So let me pull that up for you. So hopefully you saved a copy of your Amos with the measurement model with none of the path arrows in between there. So that's what I'm working off here. So what we have to do is make a covariance between every possible pairwise combination of all the constructs. Okay, so this should only take a second. So there's JS. Okay, let's do the OCs. Make sure we got the right button. And then OC to SI, OC to EP, OC to AC. We already have OC to JS. So let's do SI to AC. And then last one is this one. So every bubble, I'm sorry, every construct, every oval should have four arrows going into it. So they all look good to me. So we're good to go. So we're going to go ahead and calculate it. Now remember, we're just looking for these, these um, estimates, the path regression, weights, coefficients, that kind of thing. So we calculated. They should be right here. So on the output sheet, we're going to go to estimates. So there's a lot of data here, but we only want the correlations between the constructs. So scroll down, um, not the covariances, but the actual correlations. And so these are the numbers that we're going to use. See, these are the correlations between JS and OC, OC, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the, this is the data we're going to use when we go ahead to compare with the AVE scores that we calculated previously. Let me pull up a chart. All right, here's the correlations between all the constructs. Here's the chart I made. Okay, so correlation between JS and AC was 0.25. This column is where I squared them all. Here are both AVEs from each of the constructs. So all of these AVEs should be greater than the squared correlations, and they are. There's, there's not any kind of contest whatsoever. According to this data, the discriminant validity is good. In other words, there was no violation of the assumption of discriminant validity. So real quick, nomological validity is the overall model should be
considered valid. And since we didn't have any problems with the convergent validity or the discriminant validity, we're just going to go ahead and assume that we did not violate the assumption of nomological validity because we haven't had any major validity issues yet. So let's move on. So we're still in step three in the model identification mode. Now we're going to go and do something we call unit loading identification, which is very similar to the unidimensionality trick that we did. But instead of doing one construct at a time, we're going to do all the constructs at once. So let me pull up Amos. In Amos, go back to the original measurement model you made before you did the unidimensionality. In other words, where the computer simply assigned by random a one to one of these things. I'm seeing a problem right here. There's no one for JS because we deleted JS5. So I'm going to simply, before we go into the unit loading, I'm simply going to change this to a one and then rechange it if necessary. Okay, so let's put that in there. So again, with the original model, before unidimensionality, you're going to go ahead and calculate. You're going to click the output, open the output, you're going to go to estimates, and so these are what you're looking at right here. So here's all your OCs, your JSs, etc., etc. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the largest of each, see this one, OC2 to OC, so that means I'm going to change that to 1 in Amos, and Amos will automatically readjust all the other OCs to be proportionally exactly the same as they are now. Okay, so watch this. So I'm going to... What, what I found works best is click this little one-fingered hand. So I'm going to click on that, right-click, Object Properties. That was the largest, so that will become our unit measure of 1. I'm going to click this other one and just delete it. Okay. So there's that one. I'm just going to do one more. And then the rest I'm just going to do ahead of time to make a shorter vision, a movie. Okay. So it looks like JS2 is the largest. So JS. So again, little finger. JS, right click, object, that's going to be our one because it's the largest. And then JS1, I'm just going to delete. Boom. Okay, I'm going to do the rest of them real quick. Hold on. All right, I did them all. So interestingly enough, uh, the second one, the two in all of them were the largest ones, except for in SI. SI was number four. Okay, so what we do now is we recalculate. We're going to double check to make sure that all of our unit loadings are not greater than one. Going to go to estimates. So looking at the OCs, that's good. The largest is one. The JSs, largest is one. Yeah, they're all good. Okay, so we're good to go for that. Now that we have successfully identified the unit loadings, we're going to go ahead and look at the model fit to see if this measurement model is a good fit or not. And we're going to look at several of the indices. First one is the C-min, that's our chi-squared, which is significant. And that means that our model does not a good fit with the perfect model, which is bad. So there's one indicator. Second one is GFI, goodness of fit. That's greater than 0.9. We'll take that. That's a big plus. NFI, same thing, greater than 0.9. CFI, greater than 0.9. So it looks like a lot of these are, in fact, good fit indicators. And this last one is considered like an error. We want this to be less than 0.05. So four out of five fit indicators say that this is a good fit. So we're almost done with the measurement model. Now we're going to go back to the modification indices and see what... Amos has to say it could suggest adding a couple of correlations or covariances to increase the strength of your model. So four out of five of our indices indicate that it is indeed a good fit. So we should look at the modification indices. So we got a suggestion. It says add a covariance between the third error term E3 and EP. Hmm. Let's do that. Back to Amos. 
So it was EP to E3. Interesting. So we're going to go to our double head. Let's see if I can do this. So E3 to EP. Huh. Easy enough. We're going to recalculate to see if it made any significant difference. If it didn't, I'm, we're just, I'm just going to take it out. Okay. So we're going to go to model fit. Didn't change. It dropped it a little bit, but it's still significant according to the chi-squared. And as I recall, the other four out of five were already good. So let's see. Okay, so the GFI is still good. And I think i got to squeeze this over here to get the... GFI is still good. CFI is still good. Greater than 0.9. Uh, where are my other ones? Uh, 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 uh. I want NFI. There's NFI. Still, still really good. Okay, so they're all really good. So what I'm seeing is that the adding this covariance really didn't help the model whatsoever. So I, I'm personally just going to take it out. It, it doesn't matter if you leave it in or, or out, but if it doesn't increase something significantly, and that's remember that's the guts of statistics, then it doesn't really matter if you include it or not. So all in all, it looks like the measurement model can be considered a good fit, but we have to be very, very careful. That's simply the software program looking at the data. It hasn't connected the theory causal effect arrows yet. That's what we're going to call the structural model, and that's what we're going to start now. So now the next step is model fitting, and we're going to build the structural model. In other words, we're going to take the current amos right this is the unit loaded amos and we got rid of all the covariances and all the different arrows but here's all the constructs and we're gonna turn this into the original model by what we call putting in multiple reflective indicators those are just the arrows from the original model don't let the big word scare you there all right so we're gonna change this into this. Kabam. So I'm going to go ahead and add the arrows into our Amos model. You're going to click on the single arrow over here. And we're going to go, right, there's one here to here, one here to here, um, one here to here, one here to here. I think there's a cross over here, cross over here. I think there's one here. Let me double check. Yeah, there's one going that way. I think that's all of them. Let me give them a double check here. So I got these two. I got that one. I got the crisscross, and I got the going up. I do, I do, I do. So we're good. So I'm going to clean it up a little bit. Clean, 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 clean. Looks very clean. So this is the structural model based on the theory. This is going to tell us if this theory is, you know, will hold water or not. So let's get going. All right, after you put in your multiple reflective indicators, a.k.a. your arrows, you should add error terms to the endogenous variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply use this one. So endogenous variables, that means they got arrows going in. Okay, that's an endogenous, endogenous endogenous let me move them around a little bit here i had to use the fire truck and in the magic wand okay so but you're you notice they're still unnamed again we're going to go to a very helpful tool under plugins and it's going to just name them as error terms okay so now our endogenous variables have error terms almost ready to analyze this structural model first we got to go to view we want the analysis property button. We want the output. Click on the output. Make sure that. We're going to click the residual moments. We need to look at the residuals. Okay, that should take care of that. Now, we are going to get ready to calculate. Now, Amos might suggest some kind of different, either a correlation or a covariance between the variables that aren't in the original model. So be prepared for that. It'll tell us immediately. Oh, there it is right there. So they wanted us to put a covariance between EP and AC. We could do that. We're going to click on the double-headed arrow and simply go from AC to EP. Boom, that was easy enough. Let me clean it up a little bit. Beep. Okay, now we're going to analyze it and then look at the details. 
All right, we were going to go to estimates. And we want to look at the standardized residuals. So we should expect a couple of them to be too big. And by too big, I mean they're either greater than positive 2 or less than negative 2. That's your, that's your rule of thumb, right? 95% of the data should fall between plus or minus two standard deviations <clears throat> of the mean. So anything above that would be considered, like, bad. So let's go down and find the standardized reg regression. I'm sorry, the standardized residuals. Standardized regression weights. Covariance. It's going to be a big file. There's the residual covariances, getting close. There it is, standardized residual. All right, so we're looking for anything that is basically bigger than two absolute value-wise. <laughs> I don't see anything in this column. Oh, I see some down here. So OC1 has got one. Oh, here's a couple of them. So yeah, there are some in the OCs I'm noticing. You got a couple of greater than twos, you even got a three. But they're just they're just right here. So if, example, so if OC4, if all of these were greater than 2, you would probably delete OC4. But I'm just seeing that it's, um, it's not overly violating too many assumptions, but there are some residuals that are considered too big. So let's, let's look at something else. We need to look at the actual path estimates. So we want to look at the, the, if the coefficients between the actual constructs themselves are significant or not. So let's find the path estimates, and here they are, and here, here they are. These are the ones we're just looking at, just between the constructs themselves. So I'm seeing some serious problems right off the bat. You'll notice that the estimate of the regression weight between JS and AC is not significant. Neither is JS and SI, neither is JS and OC. Right? These mean that they're not co that they're not significant. You got a problem, seriously. So out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different regression estimates, three of them are no good. So it looks to me like this structure model initially has plenty of room for improvement. We're not going to delete those insignificant path coefficients, okay? We're just going to leave them in the model because that's what we're doing. We're testing the structural model to see if it works or not. But let's see if the computer can suggest anything. We'll go to modification indices and it says that you might want to add a few. Basically what I do, I just I just take whatever the biggest one is. So with this one, 14.9, I'm going to add OC2 from AC1, hold on, that was AC1, where are you, bam, but it was a one way, so let me collect this, so it was AC, I already forgot, hold on, this one, AC1 to OC2, so AC1, was it the error term, dang, no, OC2 to AC1, these are the items, so AC1 to OC2, where are you? There you are. Eh. So we're going to recalculate. If that did, that might fix it, it might not. We're about to find out here. Let me pull that up. We're going to go to estimates again. I'm not seeing any significant change between any of these that weren't significant before, right? No significance between J, S, and AC, no significance between J, S, and SI, and no significance between J, S, and OC. So that suggested addition from, from Amos did not work out, so I'm just going to get rid of it. All right, so I deleted the suggested causal arrow, but okay, let's get back to our output sheet and look at the model fit indices. Let's click on that one. Our C-min or chi-squared test statistic is significant, which means that it's not a good model fit. The GFI says it is a good fit. The NFI says it's a good fit. CFI says it's a good fit. Let's look at the RIM-C and this says it's a good fit, but we must be careful. We cannot call the structural model a functioning 
model yet. We have to do the next step, which is called model evaluation. What we're going to do is we're going to use composite scale indicators. Remember, the word composite means made up of many parts. We're going to use the composite scale indicators to analyze our structural model to see if it'll hold water or not. And by that, we're going to calculate the factor loadings. Remember the good old factor loadings. And the error variance. We're going to use the construct reliability. That's the CR that we've already previously calculated. And here's the formula for the factor loadings to calculate the factor loadings onto the composite scale indicators. We simply take the square root of whatever the CR it was for each of the constructs. And to calculate the error variance, it's almost as easy. You simply subtract whatever the CR was for each construct from one. All right, the first step for model evaluation is to draw a composite scale model. So we're going to turn our structural model or our multiple indicator model into a composite scale model. And to do that, basically, we leave the we leave the causal arrows where they are, but each construct, we're only going to keep one item, and we're going to fix that item. Okay, so just real quick, let me straighten this out so it looks like this. Again, you're going to leave all the causal arrows in and just keep one item per construct, and we're going to change that item here in a second. It's going to be the average of these other items. Let me just do this because this is fun. <laughs> deleting, deleting, deleting. Okay, so I think we're good to go. So now it's time to make averages out of the items that built up the constructs. Let me see if I can give you a quick idea. So remember, OC, there were four of them. OC, one, two, three, four. What we're going to do is we're going to add up all the OCs, divide by four. We're going to get a new variable that's the average of the OC items. Same with the JS item, say with the AC. We're going to add them all together, divide by the number, and create a new variable that's going to be the average of these. So we have to go back to our SPSS data sheet. All right, we're going to go to transform compute a variable. We're going to call this OC underscore just average, av. And what that's going to be is, we're going to put in our parentheses, sorry, and what goes into parentheses is OC1 in plus OC2 in plus OC3 in plus OC4. Last one. Click over here. We're going to divide that whole thing by 4. And that's going to give us a new variable called OC underscore av that's going to be the average of all the OC items. So let's click OK. And I'm just going to show you one of them, and the rest of them I'm going to do with the video paused. So let's see. Let's look at the new video. Let's look at the new variable. Just make sure it did show up. Right? Don't ever trust computers. Lord, I don't know it. But we do. We have an average for the OC. So that's a new variable. We're going to repeat, repeat that with all four of the other constructs. So I'm going to pause this video and do it. All right. We have successfully made averages for each of the four different items that made up each construct. So here comes the weird part. You have to go back to your Amos composite model and reload physically the SPSS data sheet that you just saved the averages on. In fact, real quick, make sure that whenever you make a change to a SPSS data sheet that you save it so the computer knows. Okay, so you got to go back here. you got to go to this one. This icon is you're going to have to physically... Pick the file from your computer with the new data on there. Click that, pick it up, click OK. Okay, now we're going to go to the listing of the variables. And hopefully our averages are there. There they are. Yay. So what you're going to do is you're going to click and replace. Do the EP. SI. Where's my SI? Over here. And JS and OC. Okay, so now all the items, with uh, which is only one of, has been replaced with the average of the previous items. That's pretty cool. Now it's time to go ahead and calculate the factor loadings. 
okay, and the error variance. This of, of the composite scale model, okay. We're going to use the CR from something we've already calculated from the model identification step, right? That's the CR, which we already have those values. We're going to use those and put them into this formula. So here's how to calculate the factor loading. We just take the square root of whatever the CR was for each construct. Pretty easy. Air variance is just as easy. We simply subtract it from 1. So here's the CR values from an earlier part of this problem. And with them, we find the factor loadings and the error variances of each one of the constructs. Right? We just took the square root of each CR here. And then we subtracted the CR from 1 here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to hand load these values back into Amos. Okay, so these arrows going from the ovals to the rectangles, the items, this is the factor loading arrow. And the error term is right here. This is the error variance. So we're going to go back to here and we're going to substitute all the factor loadings for each construct and all the error variances for the first for the constructs. So I'm just going to do one or two of them again to make this a short video. So we got for JS it's 0.901 and 0.188. Okay, so very carefully you're going to click right click object properties. Make sure you're under parameters and this was 0.901 and then you're going to click the error the error itself, right? And that was 0.188. Okay, so we're hand loading the factor loadings and the error variances. And that was just for JS. Let's do another one. Um, I'm going to do OC. So back over here. So there's OC. So it's 0.914, 0.164. All right, OC, click on the arrow, right click, object properties, parameters. That was 0.914. And the error term was 0.164. Okay, so we're done with those. So I'm going to pause this while I go ahead and load up the other values. Time to recalculate. Recalculate. Go ahead and look at the data. All right, we're going to go to model fit first. Okay, and okay, the C man is still saying that the model is not a good fit. But the other one, GFI, is plenty strong. It's over 0.9. The NFI is over 0.9. CFI is 0.9. So it looks like we're getting pretty much the same results. Going. We'll keep going. We'll keep going. And the Rimsey, uh-oh. That's bad. That's way too high. We want that at least to be under 0.05. Are you so now two out of five of our indicators are saying that this model is not a good fit. All right. So now we're going to look at the estimates and see if anything over on that side changed. Estimates. Okay, let's see what's going on. Up. Scrolling up. Go up. No, Keep go scrolling up. up some more. Here we go. So we got one, two, and all this almost changes. You notice it's almost. So this is could be considered borderline, but because of the model fit not being very well, we're going to say that this is not significant. So again, three of the causal paths are not significant. So now we're going to scroll down to the standardized residuals to see if this model can be used to, to predict or to estimate the true causal effects between the constructs. And where to go? Where to go? Okay, so the not this one, this one. Standardized residual covariances. And they're all within range except for this guy. Bam. So it looks like that one out of the 15 is unacceptable, but that means the other 14 are. So in a nutshell, that says that this model is kind of accurate at examining the causal effects between the constructs and can be applied to the general population or to a much larger sample size.
All right, we're going to take a quick pick at the modification indices and see what Amos suggests for us. All right, remember, we're only looking for something that will significantly change the results. And this is suggesting that we put a covariance between error terms. So we're not even going to waste time doing that. If there was something between the constructs, yeah, we might check it out. But this is not between the constructs. This is simply between error terms. So we're going to go ahead and skip these suggestions. Therefore, this structural model is not a 100% perfect model. It's, In other words, it's not 100% accurate. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and check for mediating effects between the constructs. So as you recall, a mediator is a variable between two other variables. Okay, so which is an indirect effect. In other words, A doesn't really affect C until you stick B in between, right? A affects B and B affects C. So let's go back and look at our original model. Where is it right there? Bam. So the possible mediators are as follows. JS could be a mediator between AC and OC. JS could also be a mediator from EP to OC. You got a, a lot of them here, okay? So SI could be a mediator. JS could be a mediator. And I believe those are the only two. But there's one, two, three, four. Here, let's. And the last one is between JS, SI, and OC. So that makes a grand total of five. So we're going to check to see if there are five different mediating situations. So hold on. So back to the Amos output, you're going to go to estimates again, and we're going to find the unstandardized regression estimates. And here they are. So even though it doesn't say unstandardized, it is unstandardized. Because if you look underneath it, these are the standardized regression weights. We want the unstandardized. So this is the information that we're going to be plugging in to calculate to see if one of these construct is acting as a mediator. Okay, so we're only going to do one on the video here. Again, to make it as short as possible, even though that point is kind of moot now. But we're going to check to see if SI is acting as a mediator between AC and OC. Okay. So, A is the regression estimate between AC and SI. B is the regression estimate from SI to OC. And we, we need to pull that up from the table. So, all right. So, the estimate from AC to SI is right here. Right, it's 0 0.109. The estimate between SI and OC is right there. It's 0 0.1165. So, this is where we're pulling these numbers off. And we're just going to go ahead and substitute all the values. So again, we pulled these values off of the unstandardized regression weight box from Amos. And this is what we're going to do with them. We're going to multiply A times B. And then we're going to find the pooled error, standard error, between A and B. So don't let, the, don't let this ugly formula scare you. It's not as bad as it looks. So A times B is simply going to be 0.109 times 1.165, and that comes out to be 0.127. So I'm going to substitute these values here from the values above. All right, going to take the square root of all that stuff squared, break up my calculator, gives me the square root of 0 0.0012, which comes out to be 0 0.0346. All right, so we got A times B, and then we got the pooled standard error of A and B, we're going to divide one by the other. That's going to give us a general z-score for this set of constructs. That will test the mediating effects of SI. All right, hammering on. Shkabam. So we simply substituted the values, right? A times B is this. This is the standard error of that. We're going to divide one by the other, and we're going to get a final z-score of 3.67. As a z-score, please remember what that means is it's 3.67 3 standard deviations above the mean, which means that it does not fall between the, the okay rate of negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. And what that really means is that SI 
is in fact acting as a significant mediator between AC and OC. So again, we only did one of these. Please do the other four on your own. They will be on the answer sheet here, but we're going to press on. So we're going to show you the results from all of our testing. Uh, SI was a mediator between AC and OC. SI was also a mediator between EP and OC. JS was not a mediator between EP and OC. JS was not a mediator between AC and OC. And finally, SI was not a mediator between JS and OC. And finally, this is the last step of our SEM project. So what we're going to do is, as the researcher, you're supposed to somehow come up with a better model that will be a better fitting model using different, either different constructs, different causal arrows, anything that might make the model a better fit. So we found through our investigation that, that our model isn't really a great model fit. If you remember, three out of the seven causal paths were not significant. Two out of five of the fit indices were not, it said it wasn't a good fit. So I'm looking at this, is, is if this model were a boat, it probably would have sunk because it wouldn't hold water. But now... You got to remember a few things. You're trying you the researcher is trying to improve the model. Don't let the software tell you what to do. It might suggest different you know additions of covariances or causal arrows, but again, it should make some kind of theoretical sense to you and that's what the researcher does. So what you're trying to do is improve the current fit and and of course, you're only going to use this if your original model did not match the theory. Again, don't let SEM tell you what to do. It's using mathematics to test this theory, this causal model, to see if, in fact, it is a workable model, if it is good at the relationships that it's saying it is. Okay, So just remember that SEM, by in nature, is a very recursive process. That means you're going to repeat a lot of steps. Every time you make a change, you're going to repeat a step. So you keep doing that until you can get a structural model that is what we call nominally close to the perfect model or the saturated model. And that would show up in your chi-square or your c-min. You would have an insignificant chi-square. And that means that there is no significant difference between your working model and the perfect model. And we're excited about that. And don't let Amos push you around. It's going to suggest a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. But if it makes sense to you, use it. But if it doesn't, don't put it in there. Because it's you, as the researcher's job, to make sure that it's the theory driving the model, not Amos. And this has been fun. This is the longest video that we have ever made. And that's it. MGZ out. And co-pilot, please say something the second longest video we have ever made. What was the first one? The example one. You forget about it? Oh yeah, this is the second longest video we've ever made. But we're going to we're going to put this puppy to bed. So MGZ and Copilot. Oh. Out.